and introduce the speaker this morning. Uh, the speaker this morning is Slayton Yarbrough. We've had him here before. Uh, you know, we, and we know quite a bit about him. I think he's at least been here, I know twice, maybe three times that I can remember. Um, but today I got an opportunity to ask him a question about, you know, where he went to school. Uh, he went to Hannibal LaGrange College in Missouri first, uh, then to the Southwest Baptist uh, College in uh, Springfield, Missouri. Uh, but he graduated from uh, Baylor that's in Waco, Texas. Uh, and he's going to be bringing us the word this morning. And it's my pleasure to introduce him. Please, uh, you know, come on. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> I went to Baylor for my graduate work before they stressed football, but they've kind of changed and are trying to compete with Oregon these days, so it's not very often that Baylor fans have been able to say a positive word. We stressed academics when I was there. So anyway, I grew up in East St. Louis, Illinois, and uh, was converted and baptized in the First Baptist Church of Washington Park, which was kind of a, a village on the eastern edge of East St. Louis. One of the things that we used to do in worship was to have testimony time. And this is where members, guests, would be able to share with the congregation something that God had been doing in their lives. We don't do much of this anymore uh, for a couple of reasons that blend together. Uh, back in those days, uh, people were very good at beginning testimonies. They weren't very good at finishing testimonies. And sometimes they went on and on and on, and either you had a longer service, this is the second part of it, or you uh, uh, cut in on the pastor's preaching time and the music and so forth. So I think because of time restraints that we're accustomed to, we don't do much of that. Uh, now, if we start getting close to 1130, I can see it, you know, you begin to check the watch and you begin to get a little antsy on that. So I also have learned to adjust, if I am going too long, to back off and finish up in a hurry. So <clears throat> we used to have testimony time. One of the variations we had in testimony time was when members would be given an opportunity to share their favorite passage of Scripture and maybe to uh, tell why, you know, in a sentence or two. And they would often choose something from, oh, uh, the Gospels and some teaching of Jesus or the Apostle Paul in his letters or something from the Psalms or one of the Proverbs. Uh, I uh, <clears throat> have a couple favorite passages of Scripture. My absolute favorite, if I only have one, uh, comes from Paul in Galatians. Uh, for freedom Christ has set you free. I paraphrase that, for freedom Christ has set me free. And it opens the doors to lots of possibilities in trying to be relevant. I also like the just shall live by faith, period. You know, and I put the period in there. It is following this, uh, and it's in the scriptures a couple of times. Now, over the years, as I've looked back upon this, I've thought about the idea that we have, you know, the opportunity to share a favorite passage of Scripture. Why were we never given the opportunity to share our most unfavorite passage of Scripture? You know, I look at that and, and you know, there are some passages that I just don't quite like, you know. If Jesus came to me and said, Sladen, we made it too long. We're going to cut out one verse, and you, because you're terminally strange, we're going to let you choose <laughs> that particular passage of Scripture. I know which one it would be from the Sermon on the Mount. The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, verse 48, Jesus said to those of us who would be His disciples, His followers, You, therefore, must be perfect as your Heavenly Father is perfect. I wish He would not have said that. I wish he'd have said, do the best that you can. I like that. Give it the good old college try. Kind of takes me back to my educational days. Win one for the Gipper. Anything. But be perfect as your Heavenly Father is perfect. That is a tough one. You know. What does it mean? <clears throat> well, I think one, it means we are supposed to do the right thing in every situation, in every circumstances. Have the right thought, have the right word, have the right action. <clears throat> and then, if you look at the Sermon on the Mount, in the verses before this and the verses after this, there's even more. Not only are we to do the right thing, we're to have the right attitude. 
For example, Jesus said, you've heard that it's said, you've heard the law says, do not kill. I say don't be angry. You know. And if you're angry with your brother, or we could add with our sisters, <clears throat> then go and resolve that and then take your gifts to God. You know, I look at that. I, I have to confess to you this morning, I've done pretty well on that, you shall not kill. You know. I haven't done that yet. But how many of you have had an older sibling? Yeah. And I must confess, my bigger brother, and I say bigger, that may, he makes me look small, and that tells you what I was facing during those days. There were times when I wanted to do him in. Right there in my heart. I was really angry with Steve. My Steve, just in case we're wondering on that. <clears throat> but you know what? I was such a good Christian. And if I had failed, he would have done me in. So, you know, a little bit of common sense there. But I look at that, <clears throat> and I didn't do him in. But Jesus said, it's our attitudes that leads to our action. If we can work on our attitudes, that contributes to trying to achieve this goal. And then if you go following this passage of Scripture, he talks about our motives, and he really relates it to religious things that we do. But he said, you know, in our motives, that's what's really important. The giving of our offering. You know, you know, if we try to do it for the praise of others, we've got it all wrong. We give our offering and it helps, but you know, if we're trying to build ourselves up in the eyes of men, not so hot. Same thing with prayer. There were those who liked to pray in public and were known for their long word, wordy prayers. You know, this is between you and God, you and the Father. And so what Jesus is telling us that we not only are supposed to do the right thing, we have to have the right attitude and the right motive, and you know what? That's impossible. I just look around and I cannot see how I can get that done. This is the highest standard you could possibly have to be like God in all of our attitudes and all of our actions and all of our motives. To be perfect like the Father and we can't do it. I know a lot of really good people. I do. I've been fortunate and meeting so many in the Christian community. But even the best of them have some flaws. They have some shortcomings. They have some failures. <clears throat> and when I look at this, this is an impossible standard to try and follow. I don't know of anyone who's perfect. Now, I did hear a story one time that, that I really enjoyed. <clears throat> a pastor was preaching on perfection. And he asked the rhetorical question, has anyone here ever met anyone who's perfect? And he expected, you know, of course, to get no response. He, he scanned the congregation, you know, silence sometimes is a really good way to get the people thinking. And he went from one side to another and then going back and getting ready to follow up on this. And he looked at the back over on the left side and here was a very small, frail uh, man next to this very large, intimidating woman. And he had his hand about halfway up. And the preacher said, have you met someone who's perfect? He said, well, no, I've never really met anyone who was perfect, but I have heard of someone. You've heard of someone who was perfect? Who was it? Kind of looked at the lady, pointed to her, and said, my wife's first husband. You know. <laughs> <clears throat> so, I hope no one here has experienced that this morning. But anyway, when I look at this, this is such a difficult situation. Jesus saying this, what are we to do? I found some help this morning in the book of Ecclesiastes. We don't hear a lot of sermons out of Ecclesiastes. Basically, there's a season, turn, 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 you know, uh, that particular passage. But, but here is a passage that when I look at it, in Ecclesiastes provides some help. Now, Ecclesiastes belongs to what is called wisdom literature. And wisdom literature... Uh, we have the book of Job, we have the book of Proverbs, some of the Psalms here in Ecclesiastes. And wisdom literature is practical. It, it, you know, it's kind of like philosophy, but it's not negative like uh, Greek philosophy. But it is uh, observations, it contains observations on how do we succeed in life? How do we get along in life? And the word Ecclesiastes is a translation. It's a Greek word translating the Hebrew title for this book, Kohelet. And both of these mean the teacher. And so what we have in Ecclesiastes are the observations of the teacher. He has looked around, he has observed life, and he's been really honest. In fact, he challenges a lot of the 
uh, the attitudes and attitudes of that, uh, excuse me, and attitudes of that day and time. And so we have his observations, and we have some very practical advice in the process. Let me read this passage from the Living Bible. Uh, para it's, a, it's a paraphrase, and paraphrases, I think, are good in kind of putting into words that we can understand. It's not a word-for-word -word translation. But I like what is said here. When the clouds are heavy, the rains come down. When a tree falls, whether south or north, the die is cast, for there it lies. If you wait for perfect conditions, you will never get anything done. God's ways are as mysterious as the pathway of the wind and as the manner in which a human spirit is infused into the little body of a baby while it is yet in its mother's womb. Keep on sowing your seed, for you never know which will grow. Perhaps it all will. And two of those passages really speak to me. If you wait for perfect conditions, you will never get anything done. God's ways are as mysterious as the pathway of the wind. And he goes on to say, keep on sowing your seed. Who knows whether it will grow? Perhaps it all will. So if you wait for perfect conditions, you will never th keep, uh, get anything done. Keep sowing. Keep planting. If you want to have a harvest. Now, the preacher here, <coughs> excuse me, is describing those who would gaze off into the sky and into the clouds and dream of perfect conditions rather than doing the planning that is needed if you're going to have a harvest. Those who look at the uh, world around them and say, well, it's too hot. It's too cold. It's too wet. It's too dry. It's too windy. <clears throat> Let's wait for a better day when conditions are just right. Now, I'm not a farmer. I was raised in East St. Louis. We did not do a lot of farming in East St. Louis, I can assure you. I did marry uh, a farmer's daughter. And Janice and I will have uh, been together on October 17th for 50 years. I don't look that old, I'm sure, but we're going to make it, you know. <laughs> and so uh, we've got that coming up. I would go with her and visit uh, the family on the farm. And one of the things I noticed about her dad, Errol, he was always working. It might be rainy, it might be snowy, it might be cold, it might be just as hot as could be in the summer. But he knew there was work to be done and he did it. Because he knew that if he was going to have results, it had to come from the effort and preparation for that. And I look at that and I think the preacher's advice is so practical. You don't have to be a farmer to understand if you don't sow, you don't harvest. If you don't plant, you don't reap. It's as clear as can be. <clears throat> And I think that the teacher's advice to us in this day and time is to take a good hard look at what we're doing and what we're trying to do, the goals that we have, the efforts that we make, and to realize if we are to succeed in this world in which we live, if we are to proclaim the good news, if we're to share the good news, if we're to see the results of the good news, if we're to see the harvest of the good news, we have to do the sowing. We have to do the planning. Let me say a few words about the church in the 21st century. I'll do this in a generic sense and then in a more uh, localized sense, I guess. And I do it from someone who's a part of it, on the inside looking out, rather the outside looking in and just, just criticizing. But I look at the church, and it seems like sometimes we are anything but perfect in this world. We're a people who ought to be concerned about people, and yet more often than not, we're concerned about other things. Statistics. Learned this very early on as a college student pastoring a small church on a weekend. You know, First thing we said when we get, got back together on Monday morning, those of us who, who did this little pastoral thing where we learned to preach some really bad sermons, but we still learned to preach, appreciate those churches. The first question we would ask, how many did you have yesterday? as if that was the criteria for success. If we had more than normal, great day. If people were all gone, not so great a day. But we looked at our statistics. Maybe Daryl will come back and say, how many did you have when Sladen was there? Oh, about normal, way down once again, you know. Uh, that happens. We, we look at uh, our budgets. And budgets are important, you know. Finishing in the black is a lot better than finishing in the red. 
for a year or for a month. And sometimes we have to scramble and sometimes that becomes the criteria for our success. Are we meeting budget? And if not, what are we going to have to cut? Buildings are important. You have a very nice building here and a good place for worship. And does it fit what we're trying to do? You know, and we, we talk a lot about our buildings and whether they are adequate, adequate or inadequate. Uh, <clears throat> we talk about the programs that we have and what we're trying to do. And sometimes in the process, we lose sight of the fact that we are a people who are supposed to be ministering to people within our congregation <clears throat> and outside our congregation. I think sometimes we go through stages. We depend upon uh, different kind of, I almost want to say games and g gimmicks and gadgets or whatever it might be to try to <clears throat> succeed. I remember my college years, the later years especially, and my early years of teaching ministry, uh, bus ministries were the big thing that were going to save all the churches. We would send buses out left and right, and you'd look at some churches, the big ones, and man, did they have a lot of buses. <clears throat> One of the stories that stuck with me, I read in Newsweek magazine, a couple of big Baptist churches in Atlanta, Georgia, had very aggressive bus ministries, and they kind of overlapped. One Sunday morning, true story, not a preacher's story, a true story, as they say, one Sunday morning, a church went down a cul-de-sac, you know, that's where when you go in, you got to come out the same way. <clears throat> went down and picked up some people for Sunday school. Got back to the entrance exit, and there was a church bus from another congregation blocking the entrance. And would not leave until the people who were on that first bus got off and got onto their bus. <clears throat> Jesus taught us to go out into the hedges and highways and compel them to come in. I don't think he had bus hijacking for churches in mind <clears throat> when he said that. But we sometimes do things that get in the way of who we're supposed to be and what we do. Uh, Jesus rejected the spectacular and the entertaining. Am I have a problem? Water. Oh, cool, clear water. Thank you. That ought to work. I'll just set it there. There may be a runner-up on that. I think I started getting hay fever at the wrong time of the year, but it, it's, it's here. <clears throat> Jesus rejected the spectacular and the entertaining as a means for attracting people. He was tempted to jump from the pinnacle of the temple and make a splash in Jerusalem, and, but God would, would save him on the way down. And that would attract a following. But he rejected that. And yet we in the church, you know, we feel the pressures, you know, of trying to do something to attract the people. It's not easy. It's not easy being a pastor in this day and time when you're having to compete with the late night talk show host. It's not. It's not easy, I think, in a worship service to compete with all the entertainment options that are out there. And so we work at it and we try really hard uh, to, to have a relevant, uh, good ministry that attracts people. And I ask myself sometimes, whatever happened to love? compassion, sensitivity, caring, serving as a means for attracting people. Sometimes we try the wrong things or at least we get our order out of line. We always need to try to be relevant. And the church, I think, is always changing uh, in trying to do this. But I, I know and I feel the pressure, pressure of trying to keep people awake, you know, in the day and time when they've had uh, Johnny and, and some of the others along the way to do that for them. I look at Jesus and he rejected the idea of simply the church being a social ministry. But he also said we need to, to uh, give food to the hungry, to give drink to the thirsty, thank you, <clears throat> to, uh, very relevant there, uh, to, uh, to visit the sick and the imprisoned, you know, to put clothing on the poor. Some churches are, are, are so much like social agencies, it seems like they've forgotten about the gospel. And some are so pre busy preaching the gospel, they, they forget the logical implications. And Jesus says we need to find a, an example for this. Let's look on a more individual sense. Preachers, pastors. Daryl's not here this morning, so I can go at it on this uh, particular idea. But you know, pastors sometimes, preachers sometimes, they are off gazing into the cloud, dreaming of that perfect congregation. A congregation that when they uh, call upon the people for faithfulness, they are there. Faithfulness in worship, faithfulness in service, faithfulness in giving. You know, no problems then because of that. When you ask for volunteers, you have more volunteers for the ministry that you're trying to do uh, than you need. And if God would just call us to that perfect congregation, then we could start getting some things done for Him. 
and the churches. We sometimes dream of that perfect pastor. One of the good things I've been able to do over the years is to serve as interim pastor. And I try to stay out of the way of the work of the committee. But I listen to the things that they're looking for. They want a pastor with a good education. You know, a college degree. Hopefully from a Christian college, in my perspective, from a Baptist college. Uh, a seminary degree. And if we're really fortunate, a seminary degree uh, that not only leads to the master's degree, but to a doctorate that would put us one ahead of the Presbyterians and the Lutherans down the street, uh, would put us one up there. And we want someone to have that education, and it takes a long time to get an education to prepare for the ministry. And we want someone with about 20 years of experience. We don't want someone wet behind the ears that are going to make all these mistakes. We want that person to have made those mistakes on the previous churches where they're at, so when they come and they serve us, then we can do quite well. We don't want, you know, someone with uh, no experience. We want someone who can stand in the pulpit and preach with power and authority and courage and never offend anyone at the same time. <clears throat> we want someone who can communicate and be sensitive to the elderly. You know, I'm in that category now these days. Because we have been the backbone of this church for all of these years. And we deserve the pastor's attention. And the young people need someone who's into the youth movement and can get them excited about all the things that they can be doing. And then you have the young adults, you know, and they're just kind of getting started out and it's not easy and they need a pastor that can understand them. And then for the rest of those who are kind of in the middle trying to make a living, trying to educate their children, boy, you need someone that's empathetic to you. We want a pastor that can get along and communicate with everyone in our church. That's a good ideal. That's a good goal. We want someone to be healthy and energetic. They're going to need it, you know, in terms of all the work that we have for them to do. And we also want someone who uh, can live on faith and the least amount of dollars that we can get them to come for at the same time. That's not quite as funny as it should be, is it? No. And then when we look at all of this, we want someone who can have all of these years of education, all of these years of experience, and we're into the youth movement, so someone who's 28 to 30 years old, if we can get them, you know, to have all of this background. <clears throat> and the preacher says there's no such creature out there. If you wait for things to get perfect, you will never get anything done. The church looks off into the clouds and dreams of that perfect minister. And the, the minister looks off into the sky and dreams of that perfect congregation. Utopia, perfection, things just right. And the preacher tells us, if you wait for things to get perfect, you will never get anything done. We present the gospel in some of the strangest manners sometimes, but you know it still gets through. I've heard some awful sermons in my day and time during the old revival meetings that we used to have. And the next thing you know, people are coming down the aisle with tears in their eyes. And I wonder, how did that happen? Might have been the movement of God, you know, taking this uh, very weak sermon and turning it into something good. We try to have programs and some work and some don't work. And sometimes we emphasize the programs too much. People come to us with their problems and we try to show concern and compassion and deep down inside we're kind of plotting, how can I use this to help me? That's a bad indictment, but it happens sometimes. We look at who we are and what we're trying to do and it's anything but perfect. But at the same time, the preacher says to us, keep on sowing, keep on planting. Who knows, if you sow, you plant, you know, you might have a harvest that, that, that covers all of the planting and sowing. Some may not. So where does that leave us? Where do we go at this time? I think we go back to the beginning. We are an imperfect people, an imperfect church. Our pastor, unless Daryl is different than most pastors, uh, is not perfect either. The world out there is certainly not perfect. We can document that any day of the week. And yet we have this perfect ideal, be ye therefore perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Something doesn't seem to fit. We go back to the beginning. We are a people. An imperfect people. We have our shortcomings. We have our flaws. If I had testimony time, let's all be honest and let's really admit our flaws. We might not get out of here for a long, long time if we all participated. We have our weaknesses. You know, we, we know what we want to be and we try, but we don't succeed that often, it seems. 
we have our uh, uh, unrealized potential. You know, how many times have you said in the church, we know what we ought to be doing, but, and we trail off, we're not doing it. Uh, we have our prejudices. I'm not talking about racial prejudices. I'm talking about other kinds of prejudices here. Uh, we have our prejudices. Uh, the older people look at the young people and say, take me home, Lord, I don't want any more of this. And the young people look at the old people and they say, look at the mess you bless us. What do you want us to be doing? And the well-to-do look at the not-so-well-to-do, you know, and kind of askance at them, and you reverse it in the opposite direction. The educated look at the uneducated, and they're a little bit worried about them. And, and, and again, vice versa, the uneducated look at the educated. And there's kind of a prejudice there. We have our prejudices. But we are a people. <clears throat> we are a people who have known and do know, in our own circumstances, the love and the forgiveness of God. And that's the starting point for all of us. And that same love and that same forgiveness must be passed on. It must be shared. Unless we look to the sky and say conditions are not quite right. We gaze at the clouds and say when things get better, when they get perfect, we'll get something done. The church is not perfect. The world is not perfect. Uh, the pastor is not perfect. Let's form a committee so that if things ever get perfect, we'll have a plan and put it in place. At least the Baptist churches I've had would probably try to do that. I've known in the past. And the preacher says, if you wait for things to get perfect, you will never get anything done. So and plan. There's also some help from Jesus on this. We all probably remember the parable of the sower. The parable of the sower. Jesus talks about the planter, the sower, who goes out and broadcasts his seed into the wind, and it blows on all types of soil. Some of, some of the soil is the beaten path. It's like the parking lot out here. You, you can plant seed all you want on it, and nothing's ever going to happen, unless there's a crack or two there. Some of the seed falls on, so, uh, falls on what looks like good ground, but actually it's stony ground. It's rocky ground and it just can't establish the roots. It tries to make a beginning, but it doesn't get very far. Some of it falls on ground that looks really good, but it has weeds in it, and they come in and they choke out the good seed, the good plants. But some of it is good soil. It's rich soil. It's fertile soil. It's so soil that is kind of loose, and, and the seed takes off and it grows into a plant, and you have a, a harvest of 30-fold and 60-fold and 100-fold. And I think Jesus is saying, you know, in less than ideal conditions, in terms of the soil, keep on sowing and keep on planting if you want to have a harvest. And I think that's consistent with what the, what the teacher, the preacher, has to say in Ecclesiastes. <clears throat> so here we find ourselves. We have a perfect ideal. Should Jesus compromise the ideal and say, no, you don't have to do this, it's not good enough? I think the ideal is there. This is what we strive toward. Be ye therefore perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. If we could do that, everything would be great. But you strive for it. You don't lower it and say, you know, be okay. Do all right. Do the best you can. No, strive toward the ideal. But God and Jesus also know that we're not perfect. But it doesn't lower the standards toward which we strive. And therefore, in those circumstances, we rely upon God's love and His forgiveness and His grace. And when we do that, <clears throat> if we can go out and share to all the rest of the imperfect people in the world, there is hope. There is good news for them, just like there was good news for us. And so I look at this passage of Scripture, I look at what Jesus had to say, and they're not necessarily uh, incompatible. But rather, we have a wonderful high standard, the highest ethical standard that we can have to be like God. But we're not going to be like God, but we can strive. You know, <clears throat> in my life, I can think of one or two times when I think I did just the right thing with just the right attitude and just the right motive. The bad news was that someone patted me on the back and I started getting egotistical and filed the whole thing up. But sometimes we get right there and we fall back, but then there, we hope for another day and another time. We strive, we work, we plant, we sow, we do the best we can. And if we sow, and if we plant, then those fields out there may just be ready. They may be white for harvest. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we're grateful for this day. <clears throat> we're grateful for your love. 
for your forgiveness, for your sustaining us in difficult and challenging times, for your understanding who we are, and yet at the same time setting up such a lofty standard for us to seek toward, to try to follow. We pray, Father, this morning that as we look at the week ahead, that you will help us not to gaze at the clouds, but to look at the fields, to be your people in this community, to serve you and in such a way that we bring glory to you and not to ourselves. Help us to keep on sowing. Help us to keep on planting. And we'll leave the harvesting up to you. We ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.